Welcome. We have Richard Brown here. He is a professor in the philosophy program and an adjunct professor in the psychology program at the Guardia Community College. He also is a philosopher at the City University of New York. And some of you might recognize him from his YouTube, where, among other things, he has this very cool channel called Consciousness Live, where he talks about consciousness with other researchers. His theory of uh, phenomenal consciousness is called horror theory, higher order representation of a representation. And we're very happy to have you here today and talk about uh, consciousness as representing one's mind. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this. And uh, I can assure you that after having explored the pyramids and having a great adventure, that this talk is going to be a tremendous letdown, <laughs> not nearly as exciting. But uh, um, what I'm hoping to do is to talk for about 35 minutes or so and then leave lots of room for discussion, because really, that's where I think... Um, some of the important stuff will come. So my job is to talk to you about the higher order theory of consciousness. And generally what I would like to do at the beginning is to um, uh, say what higher order theories are and why anyone might care about them. So generally speaking, the way I think of higher order theories is as those kinds of theories which invoke an inner awareness as a crucial part of the explanation of phenomenal consciousness. So there's a lot packed into that sentence right there, and there's a lot that we could debate about. But I take the primary explanatory goal of a theory of consciousness to be that subjective, what it's like aspect known as phenomenal consciousness. And I construe uh, all contemporary theories as trying to explain uh, either that target away or to give an account of its nature. And I can I think of the higher order theory as trying to say what phenomenal consciousness is. And there's different ways of saying what higher theories are, but they are all are united by this idea that there's a kind of inner awareness which plays a central role. And this idea has a long history in philosophy so that you can see people like John Locke suggesting that consciousness is the perception of what passes in one's own mind. You can trace comments similar all the way back to Aristotle and in the Eastern traditions as well. There's a similar debate about whether there is a kind of inner awareness which is a crucial component or involved in consciousness in some necessary way. So this idea has been discussed for a long time in philosophy, but it's only really recently that uh, scientists have caught on to trying to test the idea. So there have been some people that are interested in it, some vocal minorities of persons who have been lobbying for this view, but it really is only extremely, within the last 10 years or so, I'd say that there's kind of been a group recognition that this is one of the uh, um, one of what I call the big ideas that we have about phenomenal consciousness. And this group that we've been meeting with and discussing represents several, if not um, a majority of the big ideas that we have in the cognitive neurosciences, by which I mean to include global workspace theories, IIT theories, integrated information, also attention-based theories, um, and uh, reentrant re processing, et cetera, all this stuff that we've been talking about. So when you start to talk about the science of consciousness, then I see kind of the central challenge of where we are right now is trying to figure out the relationship amongst these big ideas, um, which, if any, give us uh, a part of a completed theory of consciousness and which, if any, can we kind of set aside and say these ones may be part of psychological functioning or not, but don't necessarily latch on to the notion of phenomenal consciousness. So there's having higher order theories enter this gr a group then there's a big question about how to view the relationship between the sort of existing theories that came from the cognitive neurosciences themselves and this uh, this theory that comes more from a philosophical background um, and is just now trying to be worked out. So that's one reason for thinking that you need to pay attention to higher order theories. And the larger reason, I think, is that sometimes people suggest that these kinds of theories are just one more amongst the group. Um, that you have global workspace theory, IIT, and then higher order theory, and then we want to test amongst those theories. However, it seems to me that uh, what sometimes goes unnoticed is that these other theories are themselves all first order theories. So the global workspace theory uh, suggests that there may be some higher order uh, neural anatomy involved in conscious in the processing associated with consciousness, but it doesn't necessarily specify a role for inner awareness um, of any kind. And therefore, even though there is higher order brain areas associated with the view, it is a first order theory in the philosophical sense that I've been developing. It does not posit a role for inner awareness. 
And the same can be true uh, said for IIT. It's a different kind of first order theory, one that um, talks about the integrated uh, nature of information over and above the component parts, but nonetheless, it doesn't play a positive role for inner awareness. Now, each of these theories could be modified in such a way so that they did specify a role for inner awareness. Like for example, you could claim that what needs to be globally broadcast are states of inner awareness. Um, uh, you, you could claim that the uh, axioms by IT need to be modified to include something about inner awareness. So as these theories are defended, that, that isn't done. And that to me suggests that we um, need an empirical reason to rule out those kinds of alternative implementations. And there are persons, by the way, who are trying to, to seek uh, a way of integrating these basic ideas and um, suggesting these ways of um, formulating the theories that could then possibly be tested. But it seems to me that the overarching bigger question is, what empirical reasons do we have for ruling out the higher order theory, given that a lot of the theories that are already existing have sort of implicitly ruled that requirement out. So in order to answer that question, you'd have to say more about what the theory says and what kind of empirical predictions it makes. And that to me seems to suggest that whether you think these theories are successful or not, we at least want to work them out in enough detail that we can see what they predict. And that really is the way in which I approach higher order theories. I'm not really a true uh, convert or believer in the sense that I, I don't know if these theories are correct, but I think that if they're wrong, they're going to be empirically wrong. Um, and I think that largely they haven't really been uh, tested in a way that is sensitive to what the theories say. So that's my goal in trying to work them out and say what they do and don't predict. Um, it's only in that way I think we might be surprised and find out that maybe they're true. I do find um, some some intuitive uh, pull towards higher order theories, but I think we shouldn't really accept any theory of consciousness without some kind of empirical um, reasoning. Okay, so I'm going to basically talk about three different families of higher order theories, and I'm going to start by talking about the version that I've been developing called the higher order representation of a representation theory or the horror theory. Um, and I'll say more about that later, but uh, the basic idea of the horror theory and what I'm really going to focus on in the first part of this uh, explanation of it is that in these states of inner awareness, when you start talking about what kinds of um, states we're talking about, I'm going to make the argument that these kind of states need to have some kind of conceptual redescription of the first order states but also some kind of indexical or portrait content. And these two kinds of contents, these two kinds of um, uh, things that can be in the states of inner awareness, turns out to really be a pivot point between different kinds of higher order theories. So there are those who want to just have a kind of, uh, to, to account for inner awareness as just kind of a pointer towards something um, at the uh, lower level, and those who want to just have it be a kind of conceptual redescription and so the, the starting point, I think, for me is in thinking that we need both of these kinds of things. And my kind of naive basic approach uh, at the beginning is to kind of analogize these states of inner awareness to uh, complex demonstratives like that policeman or that pyramid, um, where there is a demonstrative element that picks out a particular object in a kind of referential way, but also a conceptual redescription of the thing that you're picking out. So two ways that you can latch on to the lower order element. So I'm going to try and go through each of these in more detail um, in the remaining time. So the horror theory starts with the very basic idea that to be aware of something is to represent it in the right way. So I think that there are states of awareness that include representing the external environment and that which is not mental. And then there are states which represent that which is mental. And by inner awareness, I mean representing um, one's own mind, representing the mental stuff that occurs. And that's why it's called higher order representation, because it's uh, representations of things which are themselves thought of as representations. And that reflects my basic approach to thinking of awareness as a kind of representation. So the simplest version of higher order theory I think that you could have, and so the view that I think um, is the easiest to work out, is the view that just says, look, phenomenal consciousness just is that representation of oneself as having a mental life. So when we talk about the subjective aspect, uh, the what is likeness, the phenomenal character, all of those terms which pick out real properties, according to me, just are um, the higher order states of inner awareness, inner awareness themselves. 
So for example, if you'll excuse my bad drawings, um, I, I sometimes think of slides as a way of conceptual art. So hopefully this will so illustrate some of these distinctions. But if you think of the world as having perceptible properties, uh, properties like uh, illustrated here, maybe R is reflecting light of a certain kind. And then there can be minds which form representations of those properties. So these representations might involve concepts, like there's something red out there. Um, they might involve non-conceptual elements, uh, sometimes fancifully called R star, indicating a kind of non-conceptual uh, qualitative representation of the perceptual property. These things, whatever you think they're gonna be, are the first order states of which the theory speaks. These are the outer awareness. According to the horror theory, these kind of states have a functional role and will allow the, uh, the animal in which they occur to be behaviorally sensitive to the perceptual property R, so that an animal that has this state in it, which is functioning in the appropriate way, can respond to re perceptible property R in the appropriate way. So if this is a visual state, it might be them seeing um, uh, the property and therefore being used this state to guide their actions uh, based on vision and so forth and so on. Uh, but according to the horror theory, there is no, so that's the representation. Um, according to the horror theory, there is no experience of the redness until you represent yourself as being in that first order state. The, that's the higher order representation. So according to me, it's gonna have these two kinds of content. There's gonna be what I represent here is this arrow, this orange arrow pointing at the, the red state um, that gives you the reference. That's me seeing red is in a way and uh, of characterizing what I think of as the content of these higher order states. It's like that state is me seeing red um, or I am seeing red pointing at the lower order state. Something like those two elements are going to uh, be components of the higher order content on the horror theory. And they each, according to my view, are going to play different roles um, in the psychology of the organism. So for example, if this were to change so that the targeting relation picked out a green state as opposed to the first order perception of red, then even if that first order perception of red were hanging around in the mind of the animal, the experience of the, uh, of the organism would remain red. They wouldn't change simply because the higher order state picked out a different first order state. Because according to the horror theory, what it's like for you is determined by the conceptual part, by the redescription part. The arrow here is postulated to have a functional role in the following sense. The higher order state picking out the first order state is going to, uh, well, I don't know if it's going to, but one hopes that the theory postulates that is going to um, enhance the functional profile of that state. So it may enter the global workspace. It may have attention directed towards it. It may be held in working memory. It may be rooted for uh, further direction um, or being poised for control of the animal's behavior so that the arrow pointing to the green state instead of the red state affects the way the animal behaves according to the horror theory, but not the way the experience um, works. And if the arrow were to switch back and forth, so if it were pointing to the green state and then that content were corrected, um, the experience would not change, but rather what you would affect, what you would expect is functional differences in the behavior of the animal. They would press different buttons. Um, they would behave as though now they were seeing red, uh, whereas in the previous case, they would behave, uh, start to behave as though they were seeing green. So the horror theory predicts that you're gonna have these two different kinds of content in the higher order states one corresponding to a pointer and one corresponding to a conceptual redescription and that they're going to play these differing roles. So then you can make predictions about what you should expect in cases of mis mismatch. Um, yeah, there should be cases where you can change the first order states uh, and keep the experience the same. And even in the case where the first order states are absent entirely, the theory predicts that um, the experience will be unchanged. Although now the behavior will be absent, the, the organism will no longer behave in a way that suggests they're sensitive to the perceptual property, but they will nonetheless experience um, the perceptual property. Because according to theory, if you want to change the experience, you have to change the content of the perceptual, conceptual uh, redescription of the first order level.
That's what changes the experience. So changing the concept, describing yourself as seeing red versus describing yourself as seeing green results in the uh, subjective difference between experiencing redness and experiencing greenness, whereas the targeting relation uh, is postulated to affect functional differences in the first order systems and states. All right, so that's roughly um, at the psychological level what the horror theory thinks is going on. And often people tend to think that there is some kind of principled link between these various states that we've been talking about, the states of inner awareness, the targeting relation, the conceptual aspects, the first order states, et cetera, and the neural anatomy. So people sometimes think you're gonna find this kind of straightforward mapping from one to the other. And I think that that is, that it's much more complicated than that. So if we're looking at the kind of conceptual psychological level description on the right-hand side, the, the targeting relation for sort of state, the higher order conceptual apparatus, all of these things are in the higher order content, according to me. You might think there's this kind of, well, you can basically map these on to the brain in fairly straightforward ways, given even the, what we know currently. Um, but I don't think that's quite right, because, for example, take the first order state. What does what the theory say first order states are? Well, according to the horror theory, the first order states are the states of which we are aware. They are the targeted states. <clears throat> so they are the states which are mental um, and of which we are aware in the higher order sense. So what are those states? Well, you could be someone who thinks those are the globally broadcast states. So to be in the global workspace is not to be conscious in the phenomenal sense, perhaps one might think, but rather it is to have a first order representation of the appropriate kind, the kind of which you could become aware in this higher order sense. And so in that case, perhaps the first order states are themselves in the parietal and frontal lobes where you would expect the activity associated with global broadcast. So, and in fact, some higher th theorists have taken that route. In fact, this is my interpretation of um, Joe Ledoux's recent uh, view about this, that the higher, uh, that the first order states themselves are going to be found perhaps in the uh, lateral and medial prefrontal cortex, and maybe these aspects of the higher order states will be found uh, in other areas like the frontal pole, perhaps. Um, that's speculative, but uh, nonetheless, it, it's not the case that simply because these states are first order that you would expect to find them automatically in sensory cortices or in so-called lower area, lower order areas of the brain, because these states are not defined anatomically. They're, they're defined in terms of what they represent, things which aren't mental, and also by being the things which are targeted by the higher order states. So that's an empirical question. Now, alternatively, you could think that these first order states are the integrated information states. So perhaps the first order states are the ones that are integrated in the right way, in which case you might expect to find them in a parietal hot zone. Um, like IIT, people expect to find the correlate sometimes of a certain kind of integrated information. So perhaps those are the states of which we are aware. Or perhaps it's the re, uh, re uh, recurrent processing, reentrant processing in lower sensory areas that reflects the first order state being put together in the right way such that you could target it. So... That covers the entire cortex, uh, where you might expect to find first order states. You, you could expect to find them in the prefrontal cortex, uh, given certain views about what they are in the parietal or temporal parietal areas, or even in the early sensory areas. So I don't think we're in a position really to say right now that what these states are. Um, and in fact, you could even have like a, a really um, non-neurally based view, which says that you're not gonna find a, a mapping between states of the, at the psychological level and states at the neural level, which is what I take basically like a Dennett type view is. Um, that's neither here nor there, perhaps. But moving on to the next level, where we talk about the higher order states, I think much the same issue arises there. Because, for example, um, there are some higher order theorists who want to interpret these states of inner awareness as a kind of self-consciousness. So they say, okay, well, this is kind of inner awareness, and that's a type of self-consciousness, but not like a conscious self-consciousness, but an implicit or somehow yeah. automatic or pre-reflective, and if you know the, the philosophical term, um, self-consciousness, in which case perhaps you would expect to find this activity located not in the prefrontal cortex at all, but maybe in the parietal cortex or um, in the medial areas where there's more uh, areas associated with self-consciousness. 
the insula is often indicated in this as well. And that could be prefrontal depending on who you talk to. Um, but the idea is that, well, if you interpret these states as being a specific sort of thing, then you're going to look in the brain where that stuff is associated. So if you interpret these as a kind of self-consciousness, you would look in those areas. And some higher order theorists take that route. On the other hand, other higher order theorists think that these states have more in common with sensory metacognition than they do with states of self-consciousness. And because of that, have looked for them in areas that we associate with sensory metacognition, um, like in the prefrontal cortex. So, and I've been associated with defending that view as well. So I'm not saying that I think that there's reason to doubt that view. What I'm saying is that there's nothing in the theory which entails all by itself that you would expect the prefrontal cortex to be importantly involved in realizing these kinds of states. Um, and there's even, you know, the view which maybe you heard about uh, during Axel's talk, which it could be anywhere in the cortex where these kind of higher states of awareness um, are, because what's what they're thought of as a kind of higher order learning, as opposed to a kind of self-consciousness, as opposed to a sensory metacognition. So the way you think of these things at the psychological level is going to interpret what you're looking for at the neural level. Um, and that's including the pointer content. So perhaps that's associated with the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Perhaps this other stuff is associated with other areas. So you can even have a view where these contents are associated with different areas. Um, the pointer in these lateral areas, these different elements of the content, perhaps in the frontal pole, some in the medial areas, et cetera. So there's a, a variety of ways that you could map the psychological construct of the theory onto the brain. And now I don't think that means that you can't do anything interesting. Um, but I do think that it means that you have to uh, be careful when you're trying to empirically test these sorts of views and and realize that there are what I call implementation hypotheses, that, that the theory is constructed at the psychological level. And so by itself remains neutral until you have to say which part of the brains you think are involved in those psychological functions. Um, so I have put my name behind a prefrontally implemented version of the horror theory because I think based on my past work with Hawk Lau and, and Steve Fleming and these other people, that there's a, le a legitimate argument to be made that the prefrontal cortex is a likely candidate for at least some of this kind of higher order content that I'm postulating here. And if we don't find it there, then I think a prefrontally implemented version of the horror theory is gonna be in trouble. But the theory predicts that in the prefrontal cortex, there should be elements of the activity which associate with the conceptual description and can be very changing the experience and elements of that activity which reflect the pointer content, um, which I think of as an index or as an HTML code listing an address of a kind. Uh, I'm very much influenced again by the work of Hock Wan Lau and thinking of the sensory cortices as uh, topographically mapped out and so therefore being prime candidates for being listed in an address indexical sort of way. And so I expect that there would be a kind of a neural code that that reflects that kind of indexical pointing relationship. But I also expect that you could vary it in such a way that you would point at different things at the lower order level and the uh, animal would start to behave in different ways, but that they wouldn't be none the wiser from their experiential point of view, although they might be surprised when they start pressing the green button instead of the red button. So in the, in the perfect case where you can disassociate these things perfectly, then you get these really clear kinds of um, uh, predictions on these different implementation theories. Uh, and, you know, so some of these other ones I find less plausible, but, uh, you, you know, I know higher theorists who have their money set on the parietally implemented um, versions, not exactly a poor theory, but of whatever specific view that they like. So I just think that what's important to recognize is until we know more about how these things map on, we're going to have to sort of say, here's a version of the theory. Um, let's test that version. And this is the version that I have found uh, the the most I wouldn't say likely, but I think it's the most readily testable at the moment. Um, okay, so much for the horror theory. So now switching over to the other two camps, because I think of the horror theory as a kind of outlier in the family of higher order theories in the sense that it's non-traditional in a very specific way. And the non-traditionalness arises from um, this idea on the screen here called the transitivity principle. And this is the, from the work of David Rosenthal, and he probably is the most well-known defender of, of higher order theories in our current um, lifetime at the moment. And uh, he 
presents these kinds of views in terms of what he calls a transitivity principle, which is this is his most recent statement of, of the claim right here, which is that it's a necessary condition for a state of any type to be conscious that one can be in some way aware of that state. So as I think of higher order theories, I don't think they're committed to the transitivity principle at all. In fact, the horror theory is not, in my view, committed to this claim. I think it's an empirical claim whether there can be states that are unconscious or that we're not aware of, but that are phenomenally conscious. And the horror theory allows you to see how one kind of version of that could be the case. On my view, the higher order states, thats they are the phenomenally conscious states. And you're not aware of them usually. So they're phenomenally conscious, but they're not, there's no awareness of them. They are the awareness of other things. And that's what phenomenal consciousness is on the horror view. So I have kind of a reductive view. Um, phenomenal consciousness is inner awareness. Whereas here, they're postulating a different kind of way of thinking, in my view, of thinking about the higher theory as there being a kind of first order state that then gets turned into a higher order state. And... Sadly, everything's more complicated than you want it to be. There are two ways that you can interpret this view, and it's led to a lot of confusion. Um, the first is the most straightforward, which I call the relational. Um, the relational view says two things. It accepts the transitivity principle. So you have to have a higher awareness for a state to be conscious. Um, but it also says that first order state determines what it's like for you. So in terms of my archaic and funny drawings over here, the... Uh, relational version of the higher order theory so far you know we can all get along we say there's an arrow pointing at a first order state there's a description maybe a belief or something higher order thought um about that state as well uh we all say there's an experience of red all the higher order theories agree but then what happens when you change the pointer content according to the relational version of the higher order theory the experience changes so the first order state the state which is pointed to or picked out by the higher order content is itself contributing its content to the experience. And by that, what I mean is it determines what it's like for you. So if it points to a red state, what it's like for you is red. If it points to a green state, what it's like for you is green. No matter what other conceptual descriptions you have at the higher order level are going on. So that's a very clear difference between the horror theory. The horror theory says, no, it's this aspect of the content which um, determines what it's like. And this part down here has some other role to play. Now, what happens when there's no first order state at all, according to these views? Um, well, there you get another split. Uh, and I don't, I, going through all this stuff, I actually take, took me a whole book to work all this out. So unfortunately there is maybe a book coming on this stuff. But uh, there, there's two ways you could go here because you might say, look, there's nothing at all that happens because everything is contributed by the first order state. That's what I take Hakwan's Lao, what he wants his view to be, whether he can make that work or not, it's a different question. Um, another alternative would be that, um, well, this pointer bit itself has some aspect of the consciousness -y stuff going on, but not the redness. So it might be like, you know, seeing something or other, uh, but not any particular thing. And um, I take something like Steve Fleming sometimes to have this view where the, in, in this case, uh, I call this a kind of joint determination view where the total experience of the person to, is contributed to by first and second order contents. Whereas the um, pure other kind of view, I call the spotlight view, which this arrow is just like a spotlight onto the first order thing. And that thing down there being shined upon somehow, um, determines what it's like for you. So even there, there's room to test hypotheses. And we hope, I think, I don't know how much we can talk about this, but I think there will be some hopefully experimental work done on this distinction in higher order theories, uh, what this arrow content thing is doing in the near future. And I'm interested in that because I think that this is part of uh, the content, which you'd expect in any well-developed higher order theory. So I don't think it's gonna, hopefully it won't be the whole story, um, but if it were, it wouldn't be the end of the world either in my view. Okay, then finally, the last group of higher order theories uh, before we can finish are the non-relational ones. And believe it or not, sometimes these are, these are the hardest ones to, to really wrap your head around. Um, and it was really trying to grapple with this that led me to all this stuff about the horror theory. Uh, and the, and the one of the main problems of, with this is that this is the view of the main defender. So this is in some way associated with David Rosenthal's work. Um, and so the non-relational kind of higher order theory 
wants to accept the transitivity principle. So they want to say the first order state is the conscious state. And yet the first order state, which is conscious, does not in any way at all affect or determine what it's like for you. It's the content at the higher order level that completely accounts for what it's like for you, all the while wanting to maintain that the first order state is conscious. So if we were to draw a picture of that kind of view, then you have your first order state. So far, everyone agrees. I mean, what aspects of these you think are psychologically real? We can debate. So are there mental qualities? I don't know. Are there these first order concepts? Yeah, probably. Who knows? But we you could debate this sort of stuff. But there's got to be some state which puts you in contact with the perceptible world. And then according to these views, at the higher order level, all you have is a conceptual redescription of that first order state. You don't have any sort of pointer, no indexical, no relation that exists besides description. Um, so great. What happens then if that state's missing? Well, the experience doesn't change because there's no relation that exists between these states at all. Even if there were a different state that showed up, you would still get the same view. So in that way, it aligns with the horror theory. It says the experience determined completely by the higher order state. The way in which it's different, it says in this case where there's a first order state that's absent, well, the first order state is still conscious according to the non-relational view. And that's the part where, you know, I mean, so if you do a lot of uh, philosophical fantasy footwork, you can make sense of the idea that there are non-existent conscious states, which is really what the one way of reading the view, what it says. That in this case, there is a conscious state of seeing red when there is no first order state of seeing red, even though the state that's conscious is the same one as in some sense this one. Um, and I find that very hard to make sense of and especially find it hard to communicate that idea to people that want to test the theory. Because if they're looking at this picture and they say, which states are we looking for? And you say, well, the conscious state is this one. And you point at the first order state, then they go and look for that state. But what the theory actually says is the state you should look for if you're interested in phenomenal consciousness is the higher order state. So uh, I think that um, in, in that way, endorsing the transitivity principle on this non-relational view just clouds the issues and makes it incredibly complex. Um, I also think without any kind of a targeting relation that, that it picks out the first order state, then you end up having to say these strange things that um, non-existent conscious states are part of your theory. So that doesn't make the theory false or wrong or anything. It just means that... Um, it requires a specific view about what the contents of these things are and therefore is much more constraining than the horror theory, which says phenomenal consciousness just is that state and so forth and so on. So all these philosophical objections to the side, I largely think of these as empirical uh, questions and therefore await the specific you know, implementations of these theories so that we can start checking them off because I would love to move on with my life and rule out some of these theories. Um, okay, with that having been said, uh, I guess I don't need to talk about greenness, but uh, thank you, that's all. <laughs>